Okay, so uh, I said that I want to take the stochastic or statistical nature of the measurements into account. So uh, that's why I want to remind you of uh, some basics from statistics, stochastics, uh, which you've already heard in the uh, third or fourth semester. Uh, but uh, since that's quite far away for some of you, let me give you a quick reminder uh, of that. And uh, I'm going to do that in a very, very heuristic way. Uh, so uh, if at all possible, then uh, don't show this, don't pass this on to any statistics people. OK, um, so uh, what we would like to model is uh, the probability that k particles in, uh, in a volume, on a line, whatever, uh, of, radio of a radioactive substance decay in the time from t1 to t2. So pk of t1 and t2 is the probability that exactly k particles decay in a volume, uh, in a given volume, whatever. OK, uh, first of all, we assume that the decay is independent of time, so that it only depends on uh, the time interval, on the length of the time interval. So uh, we assume that pk of t1 and t2 is pk of 0 and t2 minus t1, or pk of t2 minus t1. Note that this is not completely true because um, typically, uh, a, for example, a path measurement uh, takes roughly 30 to 45 minutes. So um, the radioactive, uh, radioactive substance is, the amount uh, is decreasing, the radioactivity is decreasing because I think the half time is something like um, 20 minutes or so. So uh, this definitely has been to be accounted for. So what I'm assuming here is not true, but it can easily be accounted for. So I'm leaving that out. Okay, um, now, uh, Let's assume that the constant uh, radioactivity is something like C, then uh, we would expect that uh, the expected value of the number of decays in a given time from zero to T is something like T times C. Okay, um, now let's assume that DT is a very small time interval. Uh, then we would expect that uh, the probability of having one decay in that time is small, but the probability of having two decays in that very small time is, is, uh, is even smaller and is smaller by a magnitude. So uh, we would assume that something the, the probability of having two decays would be something like going to zero with dt squared, and uh, that would be uh, true for all pk for pk larger than one. So that basically says if the time frame, if the time interval is very very small, we only have one interval. We only have one decay or none at all. Okay. Uh, so uh, from what I said, the expected value should be something like t times c. So that would mean that p one of dt for very small dt is dt times c. P0 of dt is 1 minus dt times c, and all the other pk's are more or less 0. OK, and, and that approximation gets better uh, the smaller dt is. OK, um, now we look at P0 of t plus dt. Uh, so the probability that no, um, no particles decay uh, in the time from 0, from, uh, zero to t plus dt. And uh, of course, that's the probability that no particles decay in the time from zero times uh, zero to t, and no particles um, decay in the time from t to t plus dt. And since we assume that uh, these are independent, the um, the joint probability is just given by the product. Okay, so that's nothing but p0 of t times 1 minus dt times c, where uh, I plugged in uh, the dt times c for this p0 of t, which I have over here. p0 of dt, and that's, that was this one. Okay, now let's let dt go to 0, which means that our approximation gets even better. And uh, let's multiply everything with 1 over dt and put the uh, p0 
P0 of T of here to the left hand side. Then we have something like uh, P0 of T plus DT minus P0 of T over T, which for DT goes to put, which for DT to zero goes to the first derivative of uh, P0. So we have P0 prime of T is equal to well, what do we have here? We divide it by dt. So on the left hand, on the right hand side, what is left is a minus p0 of t times c. Okay, so uh, p0 prime or p0 has to satisfy the, um, the differential equation. p0 prime of t is minus p0 of t times c. So it's an exponential. And uh, of course, we have the initial value that at time zero, the, um, the probability of measuring zero elements in that time frame of uh, length zero is one. So uh, we only we are left with the fact that p0 of t must be e to the minus ct. OK, um, so. Um, um, that's uh, <laughs> that's the heuristic thing I alluded to. And uh, now that can be done for pk as well. The probability that we are measuring k plus 1 decays in time 0 to t plus dt is equal to the probability that uh, we measure k plus 1 uh, decays in the time from 0 to t and none in the time from piso, uh, from uh, um, t to t plus dt. So that should be a p0 of t over here, of dt, excuse me. And uh, or, or we have uh, k decays in the time from 0 to t and one decay, one decay in the time from t to t plus dt. So this is equivalent to this one over here. Again, uh, assuming that uh, pk of dt is 0 for k larger than 1. OK, uh, now I can do the same thing as above. I can, in, um, I can insert my, my assumption on P0, my assumption on P1. And uh, I finally, I, I get a recursive um, equation. And uh, I'm just giving you the result here. We find that PK of T is CT, CT to the K over K factorial, factorial here, because I always forget the English translation of that, and uh, times E to the minus CT. And of course, that coincides with the one above uh, if I just set K equals to zero, K equal to zero. Okay, uh, now let's fix T as the measurement time, the total measurement time. And uh, let's set uh, lambda equal to C times T0. And uh, let's consider the random variable X, which should give us the number of decayed particles uh, in that volume. Then uh, we have that the probability of measuring exactly k particles in that volume, k, um, of k uh, decayed particles in that volume is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k, factor, k factorial, and we're just plugged in the lambda for c times t naught. Okay, um, now this is uh, what is usually called the Poisson distribution, and I'm quite sure you're more familiar with that than I am. Um, obviously, the measured values, so, so the, uh, this, the space that belongs to that is, uh, is an integer, so we can all, the, the random variable can only assume integer values because we only have integer, decay, an integer number of decays. And we have that uh, the expected value of that, um, uh, of that variable just out of curiosity, let's, com let's uh, compute that. That's the sum over all um, values that uh, the variable can assume. So it's uh, from zero to infinity. Oh, by the way, it's not integer, it's a natural number. <laughs> um, and uh, from zero to infinity, k times lambda to the k, k factorial times e to the minus lambda. So that's k times the probability that x is k. And uh, now uh, the k over here cancels and taking the first uh, part of the first 
part of the sum out, we have that this is sum over k from zero to infinity lambda to k plus one, oops, lambda to the k plus one, k plus one over k plus one factorial. So that's k factorial over here times e to the minus lambda. Now this is easily seen to be lambda times e to the minus lambda by the definition of the exponential. Uh, e to the lambda times e to the minus lambda, which is just lambda. So we have that the expected value of the, the number of, um, uh, of photons of emitted, uh, of emitted photons, of emitted particles is lambda. And if you go back, um, we defined lambda as c times t naught, and that's exactly what we expected. And that was what we started with. We expect c times t naught decays in that volume. Okay, um, one can also show that the variance of x is also given by lambda, and uh, we'll use that later. Okay, now, that's more or less exactly uh, what we are viewing in uh, emission tomography. Uh, so uh, let's now apply that. And our model, as I said, will be PET. And uh, I will assume that uh, we have the pure radon transform, no attenuation. And uh, as we saw, that that's uh, really the case for, for PET. We can just take that factor out. Okay, um, now what we will do in this uh, chapter is we will use discrete models rather than analytic models, uh, as we already did in Art and Kutschmatz. So uh, let me just very quickly motivate what that means for the statistic pr statistical problem. And uh, as before, let me look at, at a pixel model like this one over here. So the reconstruction area is uh, then uh, partitioned here into four pixels. P1, P2, P3, and P4. And uh, as usual, we assume that the radioactivity is constant in each pixel. Okay, um, now let's consider a concrete line L. So this should be L. And um, now we view the, um, the um, random variable X, which should designate the number of particles measured on L for a given distribution of radioactivity, F1, F, uh, for a given distribution uh, of, of the radioactivity, and I'll define that later. Okay, obviously the number of particles emitted on the whole line is equal to the number of particles emitted over here on, on this part of the line, which should be L1, plus the number of particles over here on L2. Okay. Um, okay, so um, if I define F1 as the total measuring measurement time times uh, the radioactivity on pixel one, F2 as total measuring time times the number of uh, the radioactivity in C2 and so on, uh, we find that the expected value uh, for X, so the expected value of uh, particles that we measure on the whole line should be equal to, well, F3 times the length of L1 plus uh, F4 times the length of L2. So that would be measurement time times the radioactivity here times the length of this line over here. And I think that's quite okay. Okay, and uh, the sum uh, which I have here, I call lambda. Okay, so that's uh, the expected value of the number of particles measured. So that's the uh, expected value, expected value for x. Okay, but uh, x is the number of particles measured or emitted on a line. So uh, as we just saw, this is Poisson distributed. Okay, so it has the form the probability that x is k, that we measure exactly k uh, particles, k, k uh, decays on that line, is Poisson distributed. So it's e to the minus lambda lambda to the k, k uh, factorial. And um, well, since the expected value of x is lambda, then this is exactly the lambda that we have up here. Okay, 
So now we know how that one is distributed. And let me do that for a general case. Let's assume we have n pixels, p0 to pn minus 1. And we are measuring al uh, uh, along lines l0 to lm minus 1. Now if I have that m over there, I should also give this an m. I think this is going to be different later anyway. But let's just make this correct. M lines from L0 to uh, M minus 1. And now let's define a AIK as the length of the line of the intersection of line Li and, vox, uh, and pixel PK. And uh, that would be equal to taking the length of this part over here. Uh, then, uh, and let's uh, take A as the matrix of all these A, I, K, and F as the vector of the radioactivities times measurement time uh, in all the pixels. Uh, then uh, define lambda i as uh, then the uh, expected value that of, um, of um, decays measured along line i is given by the sum overall k, a i k, f k, just exactly as above. And that's nothing, nothing but the matrix A applied to the vector f in the ith position. OK, now, uh, as above, assume that gamma i is the radian random variable for line li, so the, the, ran the random variable that gives us uh, the probability of measuring exactly gl, um, gl decays on a line. Uh, then uh, we have that p, p of gamma i is gl is given by e to the minus lambda times lam, lam, lambda i uh, times lambda i to the gl of a gl um, factorial. And uh, as we saw, uh, lambda i is a f in the i-th position, so, so this one over here holds. OK, now. What we have here is the probability of measuring GL, GI, not GL, of measuring uh, um, GL particles. Let me just correct that. OK. Um, now, yeah, uh, that's the probability of measuring GI particles on the line um, Li, provided that FL is the true tracer distribution, right? So this is, um, yeah, that's giving us the um, this probability, and that should be a GI, I'm sorry. OK, uh, now assume that uh, gamma i are independent variables, and like before, and so the, um, the amount of measurements on one line should not influence the amount of measurements on the on a different line. So assume that this is independent. Take gamma as uh, the, uh, um, the um, vector of all random variables, choose g as the vector of all measurements along one line, then uh, the probability of measuring uh, that measurement vector g, uh, provided that the true tracer distribution is f, is given by the product of all i, e to the minus, and so on. And that's just the one above. And again, I wrote an L over here. And uh, all these should all be I's. And now I'm, that I'm at it, I should also correct this one over here. Excuse me. I somehow got this wrong. OK. Um, so let's um, now assume that uh, um, the device we have has measured some measurement vector g then the probability or the likelihood of actually measuring g when f is the, trans, is the true tracer distribution is given by this formula over here. 
And uh, we look at this, that dependent on f, so we define this as L of f. Okay, uh, so now assume that we've measured a vector g, and how does that help us in determining f? Well, if um, that likelihood over here is small, then that means that uh, the and if L of f is small for some f, then it means that me, this means that it's very unlikely that f is the true di distribution. On the other hand, if L of f is very large, then the probability of measuring g would be very high, and um, then f is definitely a candidate for the for the true distribution. So there are two ways uh, we want to look at this. And the first one is maximum likelihood. So it, it might be a good idea to somehow find the image that is the most probable one that caused the data vector that we actually measured. So it might be a good idea to find the F, we call it FML, F maximum likelihood, that maximizes L of F. So for which the probability of measuring G is the highest. So that's one way. Um, on the other end, and uh, that's one that uh, is often more, uh, more useful and more successful, is the base estimate. And this, I think in stochastics, this is called the a posteriori base estimate. Uh, we view f as a random variable again. Uh, uh, we now view f as a random variable. So uh, up to now, this was just one fixed image and uh, but we could also use we could also think of f as a random variable also now then the distribution the probability distribution would somehow be somewhere be given as well the probability of uh, that f is the true uh, is the true uh, the probability that f is the true uh, image when we measure g so this is the probability of f under the assumption that gamma is g, so that g was actually measured. OK, um, so um, this is a somehow conditional uh, probability. And uh, probably you think you'll have to use Bayes' formula for doing that and for finding the uh, that. Um, ah, OK, now we have the, um, excuse me, now we have the probability. And now it makes sense to look at the expected value of f. And that should also be a good estimate, a good estimator for our f. OK, so here we just take the one that has the highest probability. And here we take something like the expected value of all the f's, taking their probability into account. OK, um, we'll look at both. Uh, I think this, for this one, uh, we'll just look at a noise model. And this one, uh, excuse me, this one, we'll, for this one, we'll look at a noise model. And for this one over here, we'll look at the, uh, uh, at the tomography problem. But uh, that we'll do a little bit later. <laughs>